Welcome to Atomic Game Theory, folks. Uh, this is Game School, which is a show where I am here on Twitch talking about some of my favorite games and running through some of the game theory, the strategy, the math that can make these games bigger, better, more fun. Who knows? More tactical for sure. My name is Richard. I am a teacher, a longtime teacher, and game theorist, I suppose is what they call me now. And I am really, really excited to talk to you about two of my favorite games today. These are both two-player games, Patchwork and King Domino, and we'll see both of those in just a second. Um, if you have any questions, please post them in the Twitch chat so that we can talk about things. It's a classroom. Let's, at, let's have some question and answer as we go. Uh, you can also tweet at me at Armelino, which is probably... Um, I don't know that's the best way. I'll be in both places throughout the hour. So let's uh, let's break down these games. Let's talk about them. Let's see what the heck is going on. I hope you're all doing great this morning. Yes, <laughs> it is oven o'clock. That's my favorite time of the day. Uh, let's get started. I want to take a look at, first of all, dun dun dun, patchwork. This is a fantastic two-player game. I've had this one for a few years now uh, by Yui Rosenberg. Um, it is a beautiful, beautiful game where you are a quilter and you are competing to make the best quilt possible. And I love this gosh darn game. Uh, here we are with the patchwork board. This is one of the things I love about it the most is look at that chaos. That's ridiculous. The game starts with this wheel of what in the world. There is this spiral sort of thing board and you've got some pieces on it that you're trying to sort out. I'll be green today. And we'll get us back to the start. And then a whole bunch of buttons. It's fantastic, right? This is a, a beautiful setup for a game. I love it so much. Um, and I don't see many games that do this sort of thing. So immediately, when I saw this on a gaming table, I was like, tell me more, tell me more, tell me about this game. And the way this game works is, is pretty simple. You start with a quilt grid, and you are trying to build the best quilt that you can. I have never ever seen a game, I guess it is possible, where you fill this grid up, but you can get pretty darn close by the end of the game. And at the end, you will be penalized a little bit for the open spaces that you have here. But to talk about playing this game, let's first of all look at these ridiculous pieces all over the place. These are your quilt pieces, Tetris style, you're going to try and pack them into this block. Uh, you have a 9x9 grid to work with. And the first player to fill up a 7x7 grid gets a couple bonus points uh, at the end of the game, which is pretty fantastic. Gives you like a goal to work with, but it's kind of hard to do at the same time. So let's see how this thing works. There's a couple cool components to it, and then I want to talk a little bit about the strategy that we've got going in here. Um, there seem like too many options. There's a ton of chaos, and so this game limits the amount of choices that you have at any moment with this little I don't, the only meeple in the game. <laughs> this marker tells us where our choices begin in the game, and you start it next to the smallest tile. And the first player to go can only choose, well, any, at any point in the game, your choices are limited. You only get to choose from the next three possible tiles for your quilt placement. Each one of these ranges, I mean, all the sizes, all the, the shapes are unique. There is There are no repeats anywhere. Um, but as you can see, these have, let me get them up here, two little symbols on them. There is a button symbol and there is a time symbol. And these are both very important. They switch up the costs in this game in particular. Uh, the buttons are how many buttons it costs you to purchase that. So if I wanted to buy that first one, it would cost me two of my buttons. I start the game with five. Um, or I could take this uh, this one over here, this little bit bigger one, uh, does have a three, three buttons to play and only one time unit. It fills up more space, right? My job is to kind of cobble together the best quilt that I can onto this grid using the ideas that we have here. So let's see what we, what we could do. Um, my first turn, I that small piece sounds great, right? So I spend two of my buttons, I purchase it, I add it to my grid. I don't know, the corner sounds great, sure. And this piece moves forward to the space that I just purchased. And then the next player has three tiles to choose from, right? The next three. So you can see as the game progresses, they might buy this one. And on my turn, now I'm up here picking from the next three. And we ring around the rosies for a long time, trying to get all the pieces that we might want. Um, as the pieces go away throughout the game, you end up coming back around, and those last few rounds, you're actually cycling pretty quickly because most of the pieces translate to your board instead of being here in this ridiculous ring. 
So that part of the game is very cool. I can see all the options, but they're not all available to me at the moment. I can kind of plan ahead, kind of, because what if I really want this T piece and we're very, very close and then my opponent decides to pick the next thing and now I've jumped past the T piece and I have to wait to come all the way back around before I might potentially get it again. Great stuff. Now the other symbol that's on here is time and time is kind of the biggest factor in this game. This is the time board. This is how long it takes to build things. And as you play these onto your map, you have to pay for them with time. And so I would start, we start here in this big red zone. I would get one time unit and I would hop ahead right there. This board tells me whose turn it is. I love this board. It's so smart. It's so great because the person who is farthest back gets to go next. That seems to make a ton of sense. Seems like we're going to leapfrog, uh, but we don't leapfrog every single turn. For example, if my opponent buys this little tiny piece right here, which also had a time symbol of, th of one on it, they would hop one space. They're the person in the back still, and they get to go again. On later turns, I might be very, very far ahead, and they slowly take a turn buying a one, maybe buying a two, maybe buying another one, and then finally getting ahead of me. And it's not my turn until I am the person in the back, which means making big purchases is a very you know good strategy. You get very good pieces that fill your board, but the more time you spend, almost the fewer turns you get as you're playing the game, which is a very, very weird combination there. I love it. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm just checking the chat real quick. Salty horse. This is very good. This board is very unpatched. <laughs> we'll get we'll get patched pretty soon. Well, I, I don't think we're actually going to play this game today, but I hope you do play it on your own. New additions have an official change that moves the first leather patch into the inner ring. Well, now I am very curious about that change, actually, because this board has these leather patches. Um, I need to I need to hear more. <laughs> um, as you travel throughout the board, there are a couple of these little like one by one pieces here. And if you are the person who crosses over them, you get to add this to your board, which allows you the opportunity to fill in tiny little gaps that you probably have in your board. They're pretty darn important, pretty darn helpful. Um, and I like it. It's good. <laughs> now, um, here's how this so. Okay, so that's the big mechanic in the game, is you were purchasing these, you were adding them to your quilt, you are making the best darn quilt that you can, and you were really, really, really hoping that you are able to fill in all of the spaces to make, you know, a useful quilt. That's what we want out of quilts, right? Um, sometimes you can leave corners open because you might be able to fill them with a patch, otherwise that's just like telling everybody that you're never going to fill a thing. Uh, and again, your first goal is to kind of make a seven, make a seven by seven grid. Hello. And <laughs> here are a couple things that are also true about this game before I really get into some of the strategy here, because sometimes you end up in a spot where you can't buy anything. And you can tell I have these five buttons here and I've already gotten rid of two of them. If I buy two of these, I'm pretty much out of buttons at that point and I, that's my currency. So I better darn get them. During your turn, if you can't buy anything, then you can just advance on the board. And so say that I have moved up to here and it is yellow's turn. Yellow can just be like, you know what? I want some buttons. And you can do that whenever you want. It's totally up to you. You put yourself in front of the other person and you count every space on the way. One, two, three, four, five. It's telling the other person that it is their turn because you can't do anything. And you also gain five buttons. What the heck are these buttons on the board? Yellow just passed one. Well, every time you pass one of those, many of these little tiles have buttons on them as well. And you count up every time you pass one of those, the number of buttons you have in your quilt already, and you gain that many buttons. And so as you can see, there are multiple times on here where you gain a huge influx of currency if you have a ton of buttons on your quilt. Woo, right? There's a ton going on, <laughs> it's so good. So as you're playing the game, you are trying to kind of make this cool balance between not spending too much time, gaining buttons so you can gain currency, spending as few buttons as possible, sort of. I mean, you can't really do all those things at once, and also your opponent is trying to do kind of the same things. 
So as this very, very intriguing game progresses and this starts to break down, you start have to, excuse me, you start having to make these difficult choices between, oh, do I, should I advance in order to get enough currency and hope that my opponent advances? I really want that piece right there. It's the perfect look at this weird little piece right here, right? Of course I want that in my quilt. Um, that's way better than a piece like, do, 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 do. I don't know. Well, the W is always a great one. I mean, that's a, it's a good piece. It's a very good piece. Costs you 10 to buy, costs four time units, and gives you three buttons. Seems like a good deal, but it's hard to place, right? Do you want to fill your board? Do you want to get more buttons? How do you want to work this whole thing out? That's kind of the big idea here in Patchwork, and it is so, uh, so much fun to actually work out. I love this game. It plays quickly, as you might be able to guess. I mean, there's a lot of fiddling here. There are some choices here, but this is a game where I am making a choice and then moving ahead, and then my opponent gets to do the same thing. There are a lot of turns that are just like bam, 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 especially as I start running out of currency and I need more buttons. You know, I have to sometimes make this fill up sort of turn. Okay, okay. What else goes on in this game that makes it so good? The game ends when you get to the center, for you, and that's it. So if if yellow ends up in the middle, but I am for some reason way far back, like they have bought all these huge things that have jumped them ahead, I get to keep taking turns until I get to the middle. So I can take small pieces, try and fit them in, um, in order to get to the middle, and you'll see at the very end there's a big currency dump as well. You gain a bunch of buttons, because buttons also count in your end game scoring. So not only do you want to fill this board as much as you can, because you're penalized for the things that you do not have on your board, you also want to gain buttons. You want to use them to buy things, but you want to be frugal about that, because you want buttons at the end as well. I mean, holy cow. It's, it's kind of... One of my favorite games because you were drawing this order out of chaos. It doesn't make me want a quilt. I do I do love a good quilt, but oh my gosh, I don't have that kind of talent. That's the word. And so this gives me kind of that cool opportunity. It's also very Tetris-like. I enjoy that. I enjoy taking a game and kind of crunching it together. Can I get the best pieces to fill this board up in the best way possible? It's a great analytical exercise, and I am here for it. Um... It's most of patchwork, I think. I'm not sure I can even spend that much more time on it because it is it is such a perfect, wonderful game all on its own. And you understand it right from the get-go. I think once with that explanation, you could play this game to full capacity very, very quickly, right? Even if you sat down to get this game explained to you, you're off and running probably within a turn or two, uh, which makes it a very, very ideal game to bring to someone who may not play a whole lot of games. Um because it's all about very, very cool choices. I do enjoy it. Yes. <laughs> hey, Levi, how is it going? Absolutely. Uh, empty space equals negative points, right? That is that is the whole deal here. We're going to look at King Domino in just a little bit, which is a little bit different. You're just getting zero points for those blank spaces. But I do love the mechanic here. It's kind of like, you know, it's almost a game that you could play solo, right? So you could play this game just to see how well you could do it. And I kind of want those solo rules. I actually don't know if they exist. I have never even tried to look for it. Uh, there is actually a Patchwork Express game that has come out much more recently. If I take a look at the Patchwork box, oh, it doesn't say really quickly how long it's supposed to take to play. But it doesn't seem to take that long. This is, I don't know, 45 minute game maybe. They have Patchwork Express, which is meant to be played in, I believe, 15 minutes. And somehow it makes this game faster. And I am very excited to sit down and try it out just to see what in the world that means. Because this game is so fast already. Let's see. Any other quick questions here? Ooh. Levi, do you find that taking the lowest point pieces is a, val or a viable strategy? Indeed. Um, this is a tricky one because when we're looking at it, often I find myself in the position where I am trying to build the board the fastest. I want to fill it up as quickly as I can. However, that only gives you like a seven point bonus in the game. So is it worth it to fill that seven by seven up as fast as you can? I mean, kind of, seven points is seven points. But at the same time, the currency that you can gain by taking these weirdly shaped pieces with a ton of buttons on them and just saying, I don't care about those seven points, I'll let you have them, uh, has worked for my opponents many, many times. <laughs> that is for sure. So. 
I think a good balance is definitely good. You have to have buttons. Definitely don't ignore these three button pieces back here. They're super important. They're super helpful. Um, I would try to get one or two of those as quickly as I could. That way you're gaining as many buttons as you can as you travel around. And then I would just get the, the low point pieces, the low time pieces specifically, to kind of fill in around those. The low <laughs> time pieces are also weird. This one is a two, this costs two buttons in one time. And it's kind of, I mean, ugh, right? Kind of a nightmarish piece. Similarly, one button and four time and one, you know, currency button on there. Not bad, not bad, but those are going to make this board a little weird. I'm going to have to work around them. It's always easy to grab a square or a corner or whatever else. But the three button pieces specifically, this is a great one. I think this is the best of the bunch. Grab that one for sure. I mean, you know. <laughs> um, you can kind of, there is a way to break it down. I have not done the math on this one. I really kind of want to because this game deserves it. Think about the shape of the piece, the costs of the piece to try to pick down you know, pick the most efficient pieces. For example, the square costs six buttons here, six buttons, takes five time units, gives you two buttons every time you cross a currency thing, but it only covers four spots on your board. Is that an efficient use of your time? Is that an efficient use of six of your, I won't say relatively rare currency buttons, but you know, early on in the game certainly is. Uh, you're going to end up a lot more with like two, three, and four style purchases than getting all the way up to a six, a seven, or a 10. A 10 is gonna take a long time. So is that piece worth it versus this one? Just get it up here. Look, five buttons, three time units, only one button on there, but significantly more space, right? If you were to choose between those two and they're right next to each other, you get that choice today. Oh, it's kind of off the board. I had them right next to each other, um, off the video rather. Which one of those do you pick? How do you decide? I mean, if they are lined up in this order, let me just scoot some things so that we can see them. Um, and I was over here, technically what I could do, if I had the money for it, I could take this one and then have the opportunity to grab the next one on my next turn if my opponent cannot buy something or chooses to advance instead of buying it. So there is some, some sense to grabbing like the next thing rather than you know, the best thing, the more distant thing, if you have the opportunity to gain multiple things all at the same time. I don't know. Uh, it's a tricky one like that because it is, I think, difficult to map that efficiency out for these pieces. Um, I would say there are some pieces I dislike. Um, let's do a good example. This one, the long piece. This costs seven to buy. It's, uh, what, five squares? I mean, it is cool that you get that line out of it and you do get one button that'll help you out. It only costs one time unit, so it's a cheap one in the board sense, but it costs so much. It just, it kind of bothers me. And it's a thing that people bank on often. So I usually think my opponent is going to jump for this one and I tend to skip out on it. Um, good, let's see, what other questions do we have in here? Yes, absolutely, Levi. Playing the opponent is super, that's... That's why I wanted to talk about these games today. Two-player games are really good because you get a sense of who you're playing against and you get to tailor your strategy to what the heck they're doing. Four-player games, it gets a little bit more chaotic. I might let some of my opponents, you know, take care of business uh, while I just try to play my game. Two-player games are like this pure distillation of strategy. So that's exactly what I wanted to talk about today here. Perfect. Um, Daniel says, most of the time my new players have trouble visualizing the spaces available for each tile. Any tips there? Is that just the game? Well, that's a good dang question. <laughs> I remember, uh, just to do a quick aside, I remember playing Robo Rally in high school and in college and after college and all the time because Robo Rally is great. But it's a hard game to visualize. It's a game where you are a robot and you are programming five movements across this board that is super chaotic and potentially someone, you know, an opponent might push you or there might be conveyors that you're trying to get. They're like, you know, cannery things that are going to crash, crush your robot. And you had to plan out five turns in advance. And then everybody ran their five turns like a, like a program. And my favorite part about that game is as everyone was planning, you weren't allowed to touch the board. We made that very, very clear. And so we would totally... Where's, where's a good one? Um, I don't know, something like this. I totally hold this above the board and be like, you know, just because it's got like a head up here. And we would be like, bump, 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 bump. 
and all these sort of things, then fire and then turn and then move and then do. So you would see all these people doing this with their fingers up above the board the whole time, trying to map it out. And Robo Rally is a great game, except that kind of AP, that analysis paralysis is, is really, really difficult. And I know tons of people who hate it for that purpose um, or for that reason, rather. And the second version of the game, if I recall, makes that significantly simpler because we know we know that was just too much. So with this game, again, I just because of the board, the way that it's set up, I personally don't want people to pick pieces up and try them out, you know, like long term around the whole thing. So, you know, if we're over here, I don't want people necessarily grabbing these pieces because I don't want them to get out of order. It, you know, it matters. It's it's part of the game, especially as this gets sparse. I mean, right now you can tell where this one goes because there's a huge gap. But as the game gets more sparse, it might be more difficult to find those things. Um, of course, I don't mind if it's the next three choices, right? So feel free, pick them up, try them out, test them out. Uh, but it is hard to visualize those pieces and see what's going to happen together if you take that one and then you take that one and then you take this one. You know, how is that going to work? And if I'm going to do that plan, what am I going to do when I'm like midway through the board? Am I going to grab one of those or do I wait and just advance? Advance feels like I get a bunch of buttons, but at the same time, I'm losing my, you know, <laughs> control over this ring, which is never good either. I think that is just part of the difficulty of the game. Um, hmm, it does give you advantage if you're better at visualizing. So I enjoy doing that. I may not be the best person to answer this question, actually. Um you know what? You know what? Just do it. Just do it. Um, there are plenty of tokens in this game. There's like, um, uh, so we, I just have the single buttons out, but there's also like fives, tens, and twenties in here. Like the twenties don't come up all that often. Like if you want to look at a piece, like plop a 20 down, uh, pick it up. Just let everybody know where it's, or yeah, everybody, your single opponent, who is probably someone you like a lot because you're playing a two player game with them, right? And that are going to be willing to let you do this. I'm the monster here, not everyone else. Um, yeah, just mark it so that we know. Just pick everything up. I, I don't see why not. I mean, there are plenty of games where you can't do that, but because in this one you can see everything, like, just... I don't know, just use markers. I think it's fine. I think it's fine. I've turned myself around. I hope I've answered that question in any way. <laughs> um, oh my gosh! Levi totally mentions that these are flippable, right? So these are exactly the same on both sides. Just make them fit on your board however you want to. I love it. The game is, I mean, plenty of them are just symmetrical, but just make them fit. The worst thing about this game is these two pieces right here. Well, any two pieces that you have to like try to force together because they don't quite line up in the perfect way because, you know, we're made out of cardboard. It's fine. Um, but that's it. <laughs> Otherwise, I think the game is beautiful. It's wonderful. Uh, I am so happy. Cottage Garden gives you a placeholder piece to mark which piece you just took to examine closer. Thank you, Salty Horse. I totally agree with that. I think that is perfect. Whew. All right. I'm going to hop out of my board for just a second. Just bring it back to my, my face because I need to clean this game up because I'm going to start talking about another one um, real quick. Um, I am, like I said, a huge fan of patchwork. I think it is a an elegant game. Uh, I think it does a lot of really, really good things very easily. I can't think of another game exactly like it. Um, I mean, these little clicks of all these pieces. Um, do, 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 do. <laughs> um, there are, um, I mean, because you get this, the sense of Tetris. You get some Tetris out of this, some like building, some putting some things together, which is fantastic. Um, but at the same time, you have not full control over it, even though you have full information all the time. Um, let's talk about that real quick. This is a game of perfect information, and I love perfect information games. Um, what does that mean? I mean, games like chess, checkers, Go, those are all perfect information games because at any moment you can look at the board state and know everything. There are no secrets from anyone at all. And those kind of games I tend to enjoy. Uh, a lot because it's about your pure, you know, your strategy, your strategic choices. Can you figure this one out? Um, and Patchwork has that ability. I know everything. There's no surprises. There's just no secrets. You're not going to play a card that randomizes, you know, pick up the piece and put it wherever you want for the next turn. Um, I get to make my plan and find out if it works. And that is such a valuable thing in a game. I just, I, ooh, I'm a huge fan. I mean, give me that every single day and I will be happy. 
Um, let's see, I'm putting together this other game real quick. Got to make sure all my castles match, you King Domino fans out there. Not that you can see the castles from the overhead view, but hey, I'm here trying to make this as, as accurate as possible. <laughs> Ooh, do, do. All right. So, what else do we got with uh, with Patchwork? Any last questions? Any final questions? Any good check-ins right here? Do, do, do. I know, we should sand those pieces down. I mean, this is our game. We can tear it up. Um... <laughs> Oh my gosh, sorry. My wife is in the chat and is giving me permission to cut games apart to fit them together better for a game that we play actually pretty often, I think, of the two-player games that we play. Patchwork is certainly one of them. Um, what else do we got? Board gaming and work woodworking are very similar. Yeah, they are. We really, really need to do that here. Whew. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's jump on to game number two. I want to chat today about King Domino, the glorious of games. Um, do, do, do. Uh, I got to talk to Daniel Solis in the chat right now about this lighting thing. Um, we're going to work on it. <laughs> but uh, King Domino is a fantastic game. It is two words. Did you know that? Do you know how long it took me to realize that King Domino is two words? It is the word domino and the word kingdom. Someone's a smarty. Um, this comes to us from... Um, from Blue Orange Games, I gotta keep holding this box up because also look at, you can't see the word King Domino with a glare, but you can certainly see the word winner for sure, right? Because this is a Spiel Diaris winner from 2017. It is one of the greatest games that I could think about. It plays in 15 minutes. It goes up to four players. Uh, the two player version is especially fun, I think. Um, I think the three player version, just to throw it out there, is my least favorite version of the game. So if you have two or four people, play this game. Um, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for <laughs> King Domino goodness? I hope so. The scene is not as interesting this time because you start with nothing. You start with a tiny little castle. Look at that. That's great. Uh, and you set it on your island in the middle of your kingdom or wherever you want in your kingdom. It doesn't have to be in the middle. It really doesn't matter. Um, you have a piece. Oh, actually, sorry for the two-player version. I'm going to need the second piece. These are very important because these are your... Drafting tokens. King Domino is a drafting game. Um, I'm actually going to remove these castles. Not that you can really see the difference between these two pieces, um, but they are kind of our, our wild centers of the kingdom. What you're going to try to do in King Domino is build a kingdom. Um, in the four-player version or in the regular two-player version, that is a five-by-five five grid using these domino tiles, which are right up here. Two-sided. There are two pieces to them. There is uh, representing two different kind of land types within your kingdom. We have some fields um, and we have some wheat fields. We have some sheep fields, some wheat fields. That's how I often think about it. It's just we're running down like the Catan uh, resource types here. You're going to add them to your kingdom and you are going to score a ton of victory points if you can build, for example, a ton of crowns in your wheat fields and then just like have a ton of wheat fields that go with it. You score in a very strange way. We'll take a look at it. It is based on the number of crowns you have in the number of contiguous fields of that type. And there are a couple different types in the game. How does the game work? Well, in the two player version, well, in every version, you take four tiles and you place them down on the table and then you rearrange them so that they are in numerical order. All right, so we'll put our first over here right next to my face, which is weird. Um, and then uh, then we flip these over. And let's say green gets to go first today. Bam, 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 bam. Um, ooh, these are a little dark here. We have a forest tile, Whew, double forest, fantastic. That is perfect. Um, low numbers are often very similar to that. We have a forest crown tile and a sheep just blank tile. I have another forest tile and a water crown, which is fantastic. That'll help if I have some waters. And perfect, this is exactly what I wanted. The highest tiles are often these gold mines right here. And this gold mine has two crowns on it. And so it is going to give me a huge multiplicative bonus to my gold mines that I can put kind of in the same region. There's also a swamp on there. So green gets to decide what they want to pick first. And we're going to just basically draft back and forth. So green seeing a bunch of forest out there, maybe they're going to say, hey, I want this forest. Uh, let's put that down so you can kind of see it there. Um, yellow is going to go after these gold mines. Green gets to go again. How about, uh, I don't know, 
Let's get some let's get some crowns on the board. And then yellow's gonna pick right here. Hey Marzipan. Marzipan has joined us, everyone. She also loves King Domino, uh, but she always loses. Um now, I could just immediately take these and put them into my kingdom, but actually what I have done here and what makes this game really cool is I have determined the draft order in the next round. So as I take another set of tiles and lay them down, or rearrange them, put them in the right order, I will go ahead and reveal those. And from left to right, what do I have here? Again, I have two forests. I have a forest crown and a plain, a wheat field. I have a forest crown and some water. I have some water and a sheep field crown, awesome. As I take my tiles off and place them into my kingdom, um, now we suddenly are able to choose what's next. So yellow says, hey, I got a bunch of forests. It'd be nice to get some forest crowns. This doesn't really give me a good strategy, but I, I don't know, maybe I'll see if wheat fields are gonna come up. I take this, I put it into my camp, something like that. Um, and then it's Green's turn, right? So by drafting, not only am I taking the resources that I want and putting them into my little kingdom here, but I'm also giving myself the potential to draft well in the future. Um, Green, looking at all this, is is excited because they now get to draft twice in a row, so they'll like start pumping up on forests. That sounds good. Um, they have to place these in here in order. And because these are dominoes, you have to place them so that the same land type is next to, well, a land type is next to another domino of its same land type, right? It has to connect. I'm building these fields. Um, so perfect. So that is great. Uh, your starting space is wild. You got a little like crown thing here. Dee, dee, dee. Um, and so anything can place next to that. But at the end of the game, you might not be able to put something that you have drafted into your kingdom because you don't have the right land types for it, which is pretty frustrating. Let's see, what else do we got? What else do we got? Any opening questions on this one? Do, do, do. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, everybody. Sorry. I missed the moment where everybody learned that it was King Domino. Like, Kingdom, you know. <laughs> that is fantastic. That's really, really funny. Um, I didn't see the king Kingdom in there forever, really. Um, let's see. I see Salty Horse has a uh, common already, not a hypothetical situation. Let's assume the fourth player in King Domino stays last throughout the game, so they're always drafting last, um, because other players don't want to pick the fourth tile. They never get to choose a tile and always get the leftovers. Will they have a bad time? Yes, they will. Uh, that is absolutely a part of this game, a fundamental part of this game, is that drafting last means you do not have a choice. If the other players force you to draft last all the time, you never get to draft. However, the way the game tries to minimize that a little bit is the highest, the things that will always be last are, in a sense, the best tiles. You will always get swamps. Um, not always, but, you know, obviously I didn't get one here. Um, but you're way more likely to get these gold mines, and gold mines build up so quickly that often you want to get into that fourth position to get some of those gold mines. And we're going to take a look at the gold mines specifically uh, in just a few moments because this is exactly why I wanted to talk about this game today. Gold mines. Let's see, what do we got here? Uh, so yeah, absolutely, in this position, yellow is stuck. They do get the final choice. They will take this. They don't care, because this is a pretty great opportunity. Um, did I just mix my things up completely? I think I did. Um, oh well. We're here now. <laughs> um Anyway, 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 we're making choices. We're making choices here. So over here now, again, I have a new draft order and I put four more out and I might see what's going on. And look at that. Two big, huge numbers at the end. As I reveal those, I see multi or two gold mines. Oh, sheep do have double crowns. Okay, I was wrong. Um, tons of crowns on the board right now. And so green has the first choice. Um, I've given them this gold mine, maybe accidentally. Don't rewind and check. Let's just let it go. Um, they're going to jump on this one. Yellow now seeing that they have forests, they have some sheep fields. Maybe they want to build up. Well, maybe they make this choice up here. Um, green, what does green have? Green has a bunch of forests. But say they want to choose this one and yellow chooses here instead. Let's just say that's how this pans out. This was a, oh gosh, I should have grabbed them as they went. Who's playing the game badly today? It is me. Um, go into yellow, go into green, um, go into yellow here. This is going to flip this way. Um, see, now there's choices to be made here. 
Um, I shouldn't play this game two players by myself. It's a confusing game. Don't do that. It's a bad choice. Um, two lakes right here. Uh, maybe I want to match them up. Maybe I want to put this up here so I make my sheep, sheep fields work. Um, I'm not going to connect them. It's going to be too difficult. I can already tell from the way this board is placed that I'm going to end up with a 5x5. Five five. And my choices are I can go out one more space here, maybe one more space here. I've got two. Uh, this is going to be very difficult to create a contiguous section. I already have some dead space here. No good. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. But now what happens in the next round is exactly what uh, uh, we were talking about in the chat just a second ago. Is just that now yellow gets two choices, right? So we flip these over and reveal. Yellow could, if they wanted to, just continue this process, just taking the tiles that they want, the first two. Um, but then also they're not making any choices. So in a two-player game, that's not fantastic. It is forcing green to take these without making you know any real decisions. But I don't know that that is necessarily optimal play. Uh, in the two-player version, you really want to be a little bit more careful about what you're getting. Um, otherwise, no one gets any choices, and the game is not a ton of fun. In the four-player game, that's when that really, really, really comes up, and that gets very frustrating. Um, so just running through the tiles real quick, like we could continue building this this kingdom here, and it looks like, um, sure, maybe something like that. And what are we up to here? Oh, ooh, ooh, get those gold mines stacked right next to each other. That's what we want. Um, this I have to make choices about, so maybe I'll put it here. Um, maybe I'll put it here. I don't know. I'll leave some room open for some potential swamps coming in the future and things like that. So there are a lot of good choices in here that I could make at any time, right? That's the whole goal of this game is that you are constantly making interesting and intriguing choices to build your 5x5 five five grid. At the end of the game, just to go through scoring, I'm just going to let's fake this a little bit. Let's all We're all friends here. Um, at least I hope. Um, there's five. Maybe I need to go out this way. I'll lock that in there. Um, green. Place there to build that up. Sure, so we'll put you right here. And you right here. And then I'm just gonna dole out a couple of these. I just wanna show you how in-game scoring works. Um, you get this one, you get this one, you get this one, you get this one. Great, great, great. Ooh, 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 ooh. Interesting choice. Interesting choice from the yellow player right here, because this at the end of the game is where kind of our AP is going to start to come out. This is a game with some decently heavy AP because I have to start counting possible combinations. Should I add this blue tile here to gain a larger blue section? Should I try to double up that instead? I already know the answer is absolutely the blue. Um, you're going to go up here. Why not? At the end of the game, um, you could fit one more on there. So. Let's tack you on right there. Why not? At the end of the game, say that they are done. Get out of here, green. You're done. You're done for the day. This board right here is incomplete, so they will have to draft one that they cannot place anywhere. It just gets discarded. And then we are going to count up the types of fields that there are and how many spaces are in that field. For example, this is a blue field of six spaces. I'm choosing blue because it's the easiest one to see with his light setup. There are three crowns on it. Six times three, that is an 18 point section. This one single sheep field with one single crown out here is worth one point. So 18 points, 19 points. I got four forests with three, so that's another 12 points. So 1831, um, this is a five piece field right here. So they're each worth one crown point. Uh, so it was at 31, 36. This is all by itself, so 37. I even have a double swamp, but it's by itself. So 39 points to wrap that game up. And that's the whole darn game. So the big deal is even if I take a quick look over here at this green one, I, which I have not completed, and I totally admit that. I just want to move into the next thing. These two gold mines, there's only two of them, but they both have double crowns. That is now an eight point section. And every single time I add another one to it, like there's another double, right? So that is now three times six. That 18 points is worth the same as this 18 points. And that's going to build faster if I get to add more gold mines to it. So the gold mine player is pretty actually happy to start gaining a ton of gold mines. It's a major, major source of points in the game. We can fight over the other resources for sure. There are there are a lot of times when during the game you're like, what's best for me? Oh wait, hold on, that would give you another forest crown? I don't wanna do that, I'm gonna take that from you. 
green can use another forest crown, right? We're sharing resource types for the most part. So I can probably find a good home for almost any tile. The one major exception to that is, of course, gold. So let's see. Before I jump into that, just checking in here uh, with the chat. Yeah, so Crow has... Oh, sorry, Jonathan. My good friend has had this position um, and built up a ton of gold mines, right? Um, and, uh, and it does. It does start to net you a lot of points very quickly because on this board, there are plenty of other choices to make over here in, in Green Town that could still bid points. This is just three spaces taking as much as these six. Uh, and like I said, if I add one more here, it's going to be worth a ton of points and it probably has a crown on it, honestly. Um, there are a lot of blue ones that do not have crowns, although they have, hold on a second, really fantastic sea creatures. So I love it. This is one of my favorite tiles in the game. <laughs> it's no crowns, not worth anything. Um, unless I can pair it up with other stuff. Do, 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 do. All right. What else do we got here? So I want to jump into this idea about the gold mines and I want to start really kind of tracking down on this because one of the things that I thought about when I thought about these two games was kind of the decisions that we have to make as players that are playing against a single opponent. And this is really, really one of them. If gold mines are such a maximal point, maximal, that's a good math word, <laughs> or it's a really awesome animal, one of the two. Um, if this is a way to maximize my points, is getting these gold mines, should I allow my other player to take them all, or should I fight for them? In the two and four player game, you will get to see every single tile, and there are many, many tiles. In the perfect two player game, you actually build a seven by seven grid. That's my favorite, because uh, you get to see everything. In the three player game, you're gonna leave a third of these, or excuse me, a quarter of these tiles out. They might all be the tiles you want, and I hate that. You know, it's really nice to at least know what you're supposed to have in the game, even if you don't get everything uh, that you want. But still, this is a game based in a lot of ways on probabilities. There's a chart in the rule book that just tells you exactly how many um, half tiles there are of each type. So it will list all of the uh, wheat fields with zero crowns. It will list all of the swamp tiles with one crown. It won't tell you what it's paired with, and I'm not interested in that kind of memorization. But, um, but you can know that, I, I believe, for example, there are seven, no, eight wheat crowns in the game. Um, and that that's helpful for me because if I have five of them and I want a sixth one to maximize my score, uh, I need to be on the lookout for it. I need to save spaces so that I can place it contiguously to my wheat field and get all the points I want. So should I fight for these gold mines, knowing how many there are in the game, knowing that they are a huge source of points? Um, I want to take a look at the battle for gold mines, and I don't want anyone to worry about the matrix that we are looking at right now. This is just a way to map utility scores in the game. And utility is perfect. Utility is a way to, to look at our outcomes and find out which outcome we should choose in any situation. Here I have two players, player A on the left, player B up at the top. And each one of us has two choices. We can choose to gather gold mines, or we can slough, which is my favorite word from hearts. That is when... Um, you play a card like, you know, you decide not to take a trick and you throw away high cards from a different suit so that you'll never, ever take a trick. The sloughing strategy is one of my favorites. It's also one of the words that I never remember how to spell. Um, from here, we can start adding a couple numbers to talk about our utility. In this case, we can do it in terms of victory points pretty directly, right? If I grab a few gold mines and you grab a few gold mines, we're probably looking at like nine points each. I mean... They certainly build up if I can get a lot of them, but if you and I are splitting them, we're going to have minimized opportunities to, to bank on those gold mines. Uh, however, if I decide to gather them and you, player B, let me have them, I could get pretty easily 20 points. I mean, I had 18 on the board already. Getting 20 up to 30 points, not a huge deal. Um, so I don't necessarily want... Uh, you to do that bottom left option there I guess it's kind of in the middle on the bottom is the place where I am sloughing and you are gathering mines I have question marks on these because it's hard to really say what those question marks are supposed to be I don't really know what if neither one of us takes mines or, or capitalizes on our mines we'll get a few points but we're focused on other strategies and so the mines are not going to be super helpful we'll probably get about the same score even though we can't really tell from the moment what that score is supposed to be. 
Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, is is Slough also a city in England? That would be pretty interesting. I have no idea what that is. Um, I actually always tried to spell it um, S-L-U-F-F, because that's how it's pronounced. And I thought maybe it was similar to the word bluff, because you use cards to do both of them. That was my my mistake. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so given this setup right here, here's the bad thing. Like, really, when it comes down to it, these two positions are just ties. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's not super intriguing to me to tie someone in a game. I'm trying to go for the win. And so these other two positions are the ones that I really, really care about. And I need to, to study and be able to sort out, can I create a score that maximizes my you know ability to, to take these mines if my opponent chooses to ignore them? Or if I ignore them and my opponent starts to get them, can I capitalize on that? and start taking all of the other things I want to build a huge, massive score. Um, what I'm looking for here is the mismatch, because that's going to give me the, the cleanest opportunity to really compare strategies in this game. If all I'm doing is exactly what my opponent is doing, I expect we're going to get a tie game pretty quickly. That's I don't know that that's necessarily fun for anyone, so uh, I would try to let that one go. <laughs> um, let's see, let's see. So let's, uh, let's get back to this. I hope that, well, actually, I hope there were no questions on this matrix. Um, I don't have a perfect strategy here. There isn't one, right? In this setup, my perfect strategy is to do what my opponent does not do. Um, just they, they get to, uh, maybe I'll let them decide. Or maybe I will decide and then hope that they also see this coming. If we have a mismatch, I think our, our the game is significantly more interesting than if we try to do the same thing. Um, so heading back over here, just taking a look at this game real quick. This is a uh, an implementation that comes up in a lot of different games. Uh, I'm glad Daniel is here because I was going to talk about his game as well for just a second. Um, this is what I like to call I Cut and You Choose because that's what it's called. Um, I Cut and You Choose is specifically a, a choice strategy that we use um, in cutting pieces of cake for kids. Um, well, how does it work? Well, two people want to share the cake. They're both very excited about this cake and what they want is as much cake as possible, right? So that's why we're gonna, we're gonna leave it with these two kids fighting over the cake. And so we're gonna give the kids a knife. It's what you should always do. And <laughs> they have the decision to split this cake between themselves. And so they are trying to decide how best to do it, right? Um, well, what we can do is have one of them cut and have the other one make the decision about which piece they want given the two cut pieces, right? That is, in many ways, the, the fairest outcome. I, I'm totally in for it. So player one divides the resources into two sets, then player two gets first choice. This is exactly how Kodama Duo works. Um, where did my Kodama Duo set go? Oh, it's right here. See? Bam, bam, bam. Um, can even see it on this small screen. <laughs> um, I love the game, and it's really nice to to have those decisions because it's important. Like when I split things into two groups, I am saying like, I want both of those groups, but I know I'm gonna get the leftovers. So um, it's a, it, it ends up being very interesting for, for drafting purposes for all sorts of things. And this is a, a drafting game, even though this doesn't apply perfectly to this situation. Um, I want you to think about this in, in terms of I, what I want to do is I want to give another player a choice and I'm going to do the opposite thing. I'm going to get the leftovers. I don't necessarily want to, you know, divide a cake into two pieces here. But if we jump back to these slides, bam, 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 what I want is for you to make a decision about what you want to do. And then I'm going to get the rest. I'm going to do the other thing. If I have a conflicting strategy, if we are totally in oppositional realms in this game, I think our chances of having a maximized score and a more interesting game uh, become significantly higher. If we decide that we're going to do the same thing, uh, it's just not as as interesting there uh, of a game. Um, I cut and you choose. What are you thinking here? I'm going to check the chat real quick. Um, yeah, absolutely, right? <laughs> Levi says that uh, my sis and I shared sandwiches this way as kids, which is exactly where this problem comes from, um, or at least the way that I've heard it for the most part. I think that I've also... This is a um, this is a King Solomon story is also the first time I th maybe one of the first times I heard this one um, and it is an example of King Solomon's wisdom is that you know we'll cut this kid into two pieces and you can pick the biggest one if you want and they were like hey how about don't cut kids and so cool that's a story about wisdom 
don't cut kids. Um, what else do we got? So I just really wanted to take a look at these two games today, focus on kind of, I mean, they're similar in a lot of ways. They do have this this drafting mechanic where you are trying to make optimal and efficient choices all the time and build a network of to, to gather victory points. In the case of King Domino, you don't lose points for missing spaces, but you certainly don't gain points for missing spaces. There are a couple variants where if you build a perfect 5x5 five five grid, you get extra points. There's also a variant where if your castle is in the middle of your kingdom, you gain extra victory points. Those are fine. Um, I would certainly never play with them with new players because the game is, there's a lot, there's enough going on that we shouldn't, you know, that's a very good thing for experienced players. And since I often play this game with new players, I always forget about those rules. <laughs> um, what else do I have to say about those two? In particular, these games are so good. I mean, King Domino is so good because the scoring is the most complex part, but the act of making choices and seeing, hey, what I want is a big darn lake is easy. That's no problem. I can do that. Do I want like lake houses so that I gain crowns? Absolutely. So the the goals as you play are very, very clear right from the start, um, which will help you draft. That's what we want. End game scoring, different deal. Can be explained relatively quickly, of course, but not, uh, not, not the ideal for a first time gamer. Uh, although it is nice to just check in on multiplication and addition every once in a while. So yeah, um, in all, I think these games are very, very good examples of what I want out of two-player strategy games, King Domino and Patchwork. Oh gosh, I'm not built for TV yet, folks. <laughs> um, these two games are so good. They are such good um, ways to take a look at two players and build perfect dynamic strategies. They are good tests of your strategic abilities and I would definitely practice them. Play them against someone who is going to try and wreck you at these games because you will become better at games by playing these two. Challenge yourselves to try different strategies. I would do that every single time. Um, I often, when I am playing King Domino, most people that I play with know that I will skip the gold mines. I totally do because I know that they're worth a lot of points and I know that people see that. And so I am opting for that other strategy where you get the gold mines and I try to beat you uh, with that in mind. Um, which I find to be a whole lot of fun. Uh, in a four-player game, especially, the gold mines get very chaotic. Everybody wants them because they are worth points, and skipping them just gives you, I don't know, it's a, it's a great, like, focus. I'm just going to go in, I'm just going to leave these out, take whatever else I want. Um, we've got, like, five minutes here left in class. We should absolutely just check in on some of the final questions here. I just want to see if we got anything else we can add, get your questions answered before we wrap up. Let's see. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, do other two-player games have mechanics similar to this? Asks Jonathan. Um, let's see. A lot of two-player games, I think, let's see, are... There are a couple different games that have a mechanic where you have a subset of cards and your opponent has the same kinds of cards and you are trying to play them in order to to gain things. So it's kind of like a bluffing game. How much do you want this? Well, I'll play a five, you play a two. Well, my five beats your two. And so now you know that my five is gone and I know your two is gone and I'm in a worse place for the next bid, right? So there are those kind of bidding mechanics. Um, I see those often in two player games. This is my, this is our two player zone right in here. Um, so I'm just thinking about what else we got. Um, uh, Seven Wonders Duel, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention this for just a second, has one that is vaguely, vaguely similar to Patchwork, um, in that you are, you see choices in front of you, you have a couple choices about what you can choose, that game is also a drafting game, and, um, the cards overlap each other, and you can only choose cards that are fully exposed, and so if you grab a card, you will reveal new cards, and so your opponent will take those, right? So you are giving them more options by the choices you make, and so you are tempted to make less optimal choices so that you don't unlock better choices for your opponent. I think that is a solid one, but there's still not this, this grid mechanic is very, very ideal. I like it a whole lot. Um, other games that have something similar might be, I mean, roll and rights, a lot of roll and rights are coming on in this kind of grid shape right here but Roland Wrights don't have the draft. So 
you know, different deal. Um, I do find them fun. I really, really like this perfect information. It's it's one of my favorite game styles. I would much rather have that over randomness any day. Um, let's see. TMG's Thief's Market fe features this game as well. Um, oh, that's fair. I have, I've got Thief's Market right up there. Um, I was going to grab that one and take a look at it. Um, because I was not sure. I haven't played that one in a little bit. What else do we got? Um, do you feel that way about skipping buttons on Patchwork? Asks Levi, the same way being skipping gold mines in Domino. I don't. Hmm. That's a tough one. I do and I don't. I think that it is easier to kind of split up that way. If I see someone going for those big, odd looking shapes, I'm going to try and avoid them, let them have them. But if you don't get some buttons, you, you can't win that game. You just, you, you are not getting the currency that you need at regular intervals in order to make the purchases that you want. Which means if you don't have currency, you have to spend your time advancing in front of the other player. And if you do that, you are losing the opportunity to to play more time, play, or, or to uh, rather spend more time gaining pieces, if that makes sense, right? Since the time has a, the pieces have a time cost, I want to use my time as usefully as I can. Advancing is, I mean, you get a lot of buttons, but at the same time, it's just lost opportunities. So I think there is some amount of buttons on the pieces that I want to gain as I'm playing that game. Um, just going through because you'll just it's just helpful. Do I need to maximize that? Do I need to have 18 buttons on my quilt? Heck no. Um, I want to fill the quilt. That's what I want. Um, and the game kind of if you try to go for buttons, I think you end up at the end and you're just you've just gone too fast. There's no way you can fill up your board. So you will lose a lot of points that way. I think more careful play will help you fill up your board a little bit better, a little bit more ideally. All right. All right. Well, folks, I want to say, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for dealing with our little audio glitch partway through. I appreciate uh, all of your questions that I've gotten in chat here. Um, I'm so happy for everyone who shared this stream and checked it out even for a little bit. This will be up on YouTube probably later today. So you can either, you know, maybe you're watching this on VOD right now. Hey, everybody. Um, or you're going to check it out on YouTube later on. But it will be there and we can continue to have these conversations. Uh, as well, you can just get a hold of me a couple different places. Um, you can read more about my... I don't know, my writing, this will be up on AtomicGameTheory.com. I also have posts from the last few years about different game theory ideas. I have some older videos there from Once Upon a Time. Um, and if you have any questions about these games, other games, you just want to talk game theory, you can tweet at me at Armelina. I will be more than happy to talk game theory with you. And you can also send me notes once you find out what the games are going to be for next week, and we can chat about those. All right? Uh, I hope that's been... I hope we've gotten all of your questions answered. I hope we have all learned something, especially about choosing strategies and trying to pick strategies that my opponents are not going to just smash right into, creating kind of a boring tie situation. Um, there are some games very like that where you just like your strategies just butt heads the whole time, and it's kind of a crapshoot. Who wins that game? We want opposing strategies, we want different choices, and we want to see who can do those in the most efficient and perfect ways. Um, yeah, and that's fantastic. Thank you so much for being here for Atomic Game Theory for Game School. I am so excited to do this again next week. So we'll see you then, 11 a.m. at Pacific Standard Time. Daylight time. You know, 11. Bye-bye.